All right, is that better? Very good. Well, so this morning, uh, you probably are already noticing that I'm neither the great Dennis Lloyd nor the great Jim Brown, uh, two, two men that do a phenomenal job with this program every single week. Uh, this would normally be a Denny week, uh, I am told. Denny is not feeling very, very good. Um, he, I got a text from him last night. It seems like he's doing better. Uh, I don't know. Listen to any updates. Uh, so, so he's, uh, so I think he's on the mend, but uh, I will say I talked to him on Thursday when he asked me if I could take over the class, which tells you if he's going to me to take over the class, he must be feeling pretty bad. So, uh, but anyway, I talked to him on Thursday. He did not sound good at all. It was very, a lot of respiratory stuff, but it, it, that text message, and it sounds like Lucinda, consistent with the text message, he, he's definitely okay, but he's got some mending to do. So he asked that I finish out the last lesson um, in this book, and we'll have a new quarterly at the end of this lesson uh, to distribute. And so this lesson is on Solomon's fame, which, uh, as you know, was a pretty big deal. So we'll jump into that, and we'll try to do as well as we possibly can without uh, our uh, A team here today, and probably not even our B team, maybe our C team, and I'll do the best I can. So let's start with a prayer. Good Father, we just thank you for all the ways that you take care of this church family, and we pray that you'll be with Denny and Shirley, as Denny continues to recuperate and Shirley ministers to him, uh, we pray that you'll be with each one of us and those who are close to our number, who are awaiting tests or facing uncertainties or experiencing illnesses or undergoing procedures, or for the folks who are just carrying things on their hearts that they aren't comfortable telling us about, but God, we know you know. We just pray that you would use us in whatever way we can be useful in the lives of those folks and that you'll just wrap your arms around them and take care of them. And if they're not able to be with us here today, that you'll restore them to our presence as soon as possible. We thank you for this class. And as I start this lesson now, I pray that you'll be with me, uh, hardly worthy or able to fill the shoes of the two men who normally man this lectern. We're so grateful for them, for their study and their preparation, their years of study and preparation, and for all that we learn from them. We look forward to this changing season. We are grateful that today it appears there's going to be some relief from the heat and maybe a little more rain. We pray that that can continue if it is your will and that you will bring us safely and as comfortably as possible into fall. Thank you most of all for Jesus, and it is his example that we turn to when we face uncertainty. We believe that all things can be and are redeemed in him and is in his great and powerful and holy name we pray, amen. So I wanna begin with the reading. The focal points are on this first slide, but particularly we're gonna lean heavily on Second Chronicles. And I'm actually reading from a translation, you may be familiar with it, called the New English Translation. It's not that different from others that you've seen, but it was just the one that I was able to grab coming out the door. And so this is Second Chronicles chapter 9, beginning at verse 1. And this is the Queen of Sheba episode, which is one of the most interesting and very scant detailed stories in the Bible given the level of interest that it's inspired since then. When the queen of Sheba heard about Solomon, she came to challenge him with difficult questions. She arrived in Jerusalem with a great display of pomp, bringing with her camels, carrying spices, a very large quantity of gold and precious gems. She visited Solomon and discussed with him everything that was on her mind. Solomon answered all her questions. There was no question too complex for the king. When the queen of Sheba saw for herself Solomon's extensive wisdom, the palace he had built, the food in his banquet hall, his servants and attendants in their robes, his cupbearers in their robes, and his burnt sacrifices, which he presented in the Lord's temple, she was amazed. She said to the king, 
the report I heard in my own country about your wise sayings and insight was true. I did not believe these things until I came and saw them with my own eyes. Indeed, I didn't even hear half the story. Your wisdom surpasses what was reported to me. Your attendants who stand before you at all times and hear your wise sayings are truly happy. May the Lord your God be praised because he favored you by placing you on his throne as the one ruling on his behalf. Because of your God's love for Israel and his lasting commitment to them, he made you king over them so you could make just and right decisions. She gave the king 120 talents of gold and a very large quantity of spices and precious gems. The quantity of spices the queen of Sheba gave King Solomon has never been matched. Haran's servants, aided by Solomon's servants, brought gold from Ophir, as well as fine timber and precious gems. With the timber, the king made steps for the Lord's temple and royal palace as well as stringed instruments for the musicians. No one had seen anything like them in the land of Judah prior to that. King Solomon gave the queen of Sheba everything she requested, more than what she had brought him. Then she left and returned to her homeland with her attendants. This chapter also covers a section on Solomon's wealth, which I won't read right now, and maybe more than we're able to really dive into today, but I do commend it to your reading. It's important to, to understand uh, this story. So let's jump right in. So first of all, the key passages, I have them up on the screen, particularly that second, that uh, second Chronicles passage that I just read a big chunk of to you, but also King Solomon's own reflections as they are captured in a couple of places in Ecclesiastes, which we'll talk about as we go through this. So let's place this in history, and you've probably already done this, and you may already know this. These dates are all approximate. You see that little squiggly on my slide where it says, when was he born, when he died, when he reigned. So sometime around 1000 BC, we think he was born, and sometime around 930 BC is when we think he died. He reigned for different calculations. Most people try to center it around 40 years because of some of the language in the text. That would put it in the last 39 and a half, 40 years of his life, 970 to 931. This was a period of time that is known as actually Iron Age II. It's part of the Iron Age. And for, again, stuff you probably already know, but it's kind of interesting because it explains, I think, a lot of what we read in this section. Before the Iron Age was an age called the Bronze Age. And during the Bronze Age, metalworking was getting underway, but it was really in the Iron Age that real metallurgy, uh, almost as we understand it today, began to be a scientific and artistic pursuit and mechanical pursuit of, of people in the ancient Near East and in Europe and other, pla other places around Asia. And so that opened a lot of doors. One of the biggest doors that it opened was it made it possible to build really effective shields, which you'll read about later in this chapter when we talk about uh, Solomon's wealth. Before that point, armor wasn't nearly as common. Now, you read about armor in the story of David and things like that, but that was a lot harder to make. It relied a lot on other materials. It relied a lot on molds, and it, it wasn't as practical to equip mass armies with it. Also, iron chariots became really a big part of war making during the second part of the Iron Age, which is going to be the part that starts right about now in this story and runs all the way till the Babylonian Empire starts to really dominate the scene. And then that is another big shift. And so all these things made it possible for these countries, these tribes and these countries, and sometimes these just, you know, sort of loose familial associations all over to start doing things that would begin the would be the beginning of true empires right as we really understand empires even today where a country could conquer another country and then just roll and roll and go further and further out until huge chunks of the known world were under the hand of a single king or a group of kings and queens and this is really the beginning of that era it's really important in the story of Israel because this is really peak Israel. It's what we call the United Monarchy. And so you, you know after this, and we'll talk about it on the next slide, 
after Solomon, it's a very short period of time till all of these people are going to split up. Ten tribes are going to be northern, and the rest are going to be southern. Northern's going to center around a place called Samaria, and southern is going to have Jerusalem in the top part of it, the north part of it, but it's, it's going to be really where Jerusalem is held. And that's going to start a whole bunch of stuff that will really define the rest of the Old Testament for most of us, at least as we tend to think of it. Um, you can see I've got a map of this area. It's a large swath. It's a lot of control and obviously a tremendous amount of control of the coast along the Mediterranean there. And so that's very important. It's a very powerful time. So a lot of people think of, you know, the end of David's reign and Solomon and Solomon building the temple and all those things as really the peak of this period of time for God's people. Um, so in Second Chronicles, let's go through the first few chapters that we've already covered. Um, Solomon becomes king. Remember, he kind of became a it became king. It was what David wanted. It's what God wanted, but there was a lot of palace intrigue. There were competitors for the throne among other sons. Then Solomon immediately, it appears, gets to work on his main mission in life, which is to build the temple, right? He identifies where he's going to get materials. It identifies where he's going to get um, workers and craftsmen and begins the process of, of putting the temple together and then the temple is constructed, it's dedicated, it's again golden age, moment of triumph, something big that has been, we've been waiting for for a long time. Remember God wouldn't let David build the temple. Uh, he, he gave it to his son to do it and then God, you know, speaks to Solomon and he says, you better be faithful because if you're not faithful, I'm going to tear your kingdom away from you. And we all know Solomon, not so great at that, right? He loved women. He loved those wives and those concubines. He, he didn't mind at all that the vast majority of people that he was beginning to collaborate with were idolaters. Uh, and over time, right after the episodes that we're covering today, you're really going to see the end of all of this, right? And Solomon is going to lose it all, but God's going to say, listen, you really messed up, but out of respect for your dad, I'm going to not tear your kingdom away from you during your own life. I'm going to do it to your son, which again, you know, for a lot of us, that would be almost worse, right? The idea that I've messed up and everything is going to be lost by the person I hand it to who is my who's my heir. And so what happens after that, and again, this is after our section today, um, you see the unfaithfulness of Solomon playing out in the division of that kingdom, which I'll jump back to that previous slide for just a second. This big, beautiful thing, as our former president would say, to this much smaller, less significant thing, two places, one with the real, true capital of God's world, and the other with Samaria and most of the tribes. And that's where it is. We have two different kings. They're splitting up. They're doing their, their own thing. And again, from there, you end up with a lot of idolatry, a lot of really bad things. Captivity follows not too long after. And like I said, in just a few hundred years, the dominant powers of this area will not be the great King Solomon and the throne of David. In many ways, it's lost until Jesus comes, right? The dominant powers of this era will be the idolaters who roll around and are used to punish God's people. So we're right kind of in this really important moment, uh, a, a real sort of hinge point for a lot of us who read this, and that's where we are today. And so that takes us up to the Queen of Sheba episode. Now before I talk about what's on this slide, I want to say some things about the Queen of Sheba. You may know this. Uh, if you don't and you just are curious about things like this, I mentioned at the beginning, the Queen of Sheba story is kind of vaguely recounted. We don't know much about the Queen of Sheba. We've tried to piece it together historically, and if, I'm sure there's probably some historians or retired historians in here who know way more about this than I do. But one thing that's interesting is that the character that we have in our Bibles as the Queen of Sheba is referred to in the Quran. Not a huge surprise, right? Common Abrahamic people. It's part of Arabian legend. It's part of Ethiopian legend. The Ethiopian national uh, epic has this character that we call the Queen of Sheba in it. Um, there are 
people in Africa, many of them who came through the Ethiopian culture, who believe that they are actually the true Jews because they descended from a romantic relationship between Solomon and the Queen of Sheba. There were a lot of things that we would describe today, even today, as pornographic that were written about this encounter, things that are not biblical. None of those other things necessarily have any connection to the biblical writings. The rabbis had a lot of beliefs by the time of Jesus about Solomon because of his incredible wisdom. He had become kind of a mystical figure in many ways because God had given him this special power of wisdom, which, you know, in, in ancient Judaism, to be wise, there's nothing better, right? To know how the world works from a God viewpoint. And so the rabbis, again, this isn't in the Bible, the rabbis' writings, some of them believed that he could summon animals to him to do various things. And you hear, you read things in the Bible that you understand where they got that, like that he can put, have just, you know, animals around him and things like that in a couple of places in the Bible. And it's hard to tell if it's literal or if it's talking about a statue. But none of this is really in the Bible. But the rabbis believed that the um, information about his his fame, which is what we're going to talk about today, was communicated by talking birds that he would send abroad and that would come back to him with information. And so all of these things are very popular, and all of this really links up to the fascination with the Queen of Sheba, because we know so little about her. This exact same story with almost a few words, with hardly a few words different, almost the same words all the way through, is captured in 1 Kings 10. And so they're very consistent in the biblical, the biblical version of it. Well, who was the, the queen of Sheba? We think Sheba was Sabah, which is part of Yemen and very important part of uh, Arabia at the time, very strategic, just like Yemen is very important to us today. Not the exact same geographic footprint we have for Yemen, but very important. Um, a side note about this, those of you who love to read biblical genealogies know there's a Sheba in Genesis, right? Uh, it's a great, 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 great descendant when they're going through who are the descendants of Ham and all that. Not necessarily a female descendant, probably a male descendant, but some people connect all that up and say this was all part of the table of nations, which is a big part of the Genesis story. So anyway, um, how far did she come? Well, your book says 1,200 miles. A lot of sources will say 1,500 miles, but a long way, right? We're in an era where people don't have any kind of transportation technology that we would consider using for a 1,200-mile journey, right? I mean, this is, this is a big commitment other than the Appalachian Trail, Appalachian Trail hike. This is not something people do now on foot or on horseback very often. And Jesus himself affirms this story when he's talking about the queen of the south, and he makes an analogy between the queen of the south and the queen of Sheba, and he says in Matthew 12, 42, they came from the ends of the earth. The queen of Sheba came from the ends of the earth, so a long way, to hear what Solomon's wisdom had to say. Think what it is gonna be like now that I am here, right? Think what that's going to be like now that I, Jesus, am here. Because Solomon has got nothing on me, right? That's what he's saying right there in Matthew 12, 42. Um, famous. Right from the beginning in this narrative, we read that the Queen of Sheba had heard of Solomon's fame. She had heard of Solomon's fame. And so she came with questions, came with questions for him. She's going to, what's the number one thing we talk about? The wisdom. If he's really, really wise, there are these things that have been puzzling me for a long time. Um, the word there, according to the commentators that I read, is C-H-I-D-A-H. I probably will mess up the pronunciation, but Shada or Shada or something like that, meaning riddle. Not riddle in the sense of a like a you know, knick-knack type uh, joke, but a riddle in the sense of the great secrets of the world the things the elders would ponder and try to make sense of, right? Probably things, everything from the movement of the planets and the stars to include things like what happens after you die? Because if you read your Old Testament, we don't know very much about it, right? 
And was this a problem for Solomon? According to the narrative, no problem for him at all. He was able to answer all of her questions. Here, the translation, if you have some Bibles, is very hard to read, but the, be- the easier re- to read translations say there was nothing that was too hard for him to explain. So he had not just wisdom, but he had that very special kind of wisdom, which many college professors lack, which is the ability to explain what you know, right? I mean, it's one thing to know a lot, but it's hard sometimes to break that down so that the rest of us can understand it. Um, what about his wealth? Well, here's all the things you have in the narrative, right? Number one, saw the house he had built, saw the food on his table, saw the positions of his officers, right? All the ranks and all the commands of his officers, saw the duty of his servants, how loyal they were, but also what they were responsible for, what what was under them, right? Because again, in the Bible, sometimes servant means like a manservant or a slave, but sometimes the idea of servant carries with the idea of having to govern something, making maybe taking responsibility for a piece of your business or maybe even your, um, your government. And the servant's clothing, even the servants were arrayed in fine clothing. And then, and this was a close call, what is meant here about this last part, but I'm going to take the positive view on it and say, and she saw Solomon's faith, the burnt offerings he was making at the house of Yahweh, the burnt offerings. So she saw, or she saw and heard wisdom and confirmed it. She saw and heard wealth and confirmed it, and she got a glimpse of how he interacts with his God, how he interacts with his God. Now, you could look at that and say, well, she was, that's just another kind of wealth. She was impressed with the, the caliber, the quality of, the, of those burnt offerings, but let's, let's assume that for things she says later that she understood his reverence to God. Um, she was, the, my translation says, breathless, um, awestruck. And a word I just wanted to type on this slide, because you don't hear it nearly enough, gobsmacked, right? Don't you miss that word? I don't know if you ever heard that word. I love that word, gobsmacked. Just amazed, astounded. There was no longer, my translation says, there's no longer any breath in her. And she looks at what has she seen, she thinks about what she's heard, and she says, the word which I heard in my land concerning your words and your wisdom is true, but I did not believe their words until I came and saw with my own eyes. And behold, half the greatness of your wisdom was not reported to me. You surpassed the rumors that I heard. All right, so she's impressed, right? This is a big deal. So he was famous. The hype is real. And she goes through this thing, which we read a minute ago. She praises, um, she praises him and says, you and your servants are blessed. Blessings to God who put you in this role. He obviously delights in you, and he wanted you to be in charge of his throne so you could impart wisdom to his people and rule justly and all the things, all this. And so this is really important because, you know, we talk about this a lot with, uh, is, you know, is the state of Israel and the want to be a state of Palestine. You know, are we going to recognize Palestine? Which countries refuse to recognize Israel? Here you have a foreign power coming from what was then, as Jesus says, the ends of the earth saying, you're the authoritative, authentic, God-installed king of this place and these people. I can see that now. And it's also really important because as I talked about at the beginning, if you remember when Jesus, I'm sorry, when, um, when uh, Solomon ascended to the throne, It wasn't a straight-ahead journey, right? Adonijah and others were kind of in there. And so there were lots of people, probably still grumblers, who were like, you know, I don't know, he's not my king. Kind of like after our elections where people will say things like, you know, the the losing side will say, well, he's not my president. Um, Technically, yes, he is, but I understand what you're saying. So then they exchange wealth. Um, She gives him a bunch of stuff, and he gives her even more stuff. And it probably does something important here. One, she's giving him a tribute customary, honoring him, but it probably also solidifies a new trading relationship. There's recently been an archaeological discovery uh, of some of the spices that are identified in this section in Israel, previously not found anywhere else, and the archaeologist who discovered it said this is this probably proves the Queen of Sheba visit actually happened because these are things so exotic 
that the only way they could have arrived and judging from the dating of this pottery would have been this time period. So big deal to get spice. I think someone says in one of these sections, the word spice appears over 20 times. Spice was a big deal. So that's the Queen of Sheba episode. So let's break it down a little bit and get to the, the heart of the matter. There's a lot of positive things that we can say about Solomon's fame in this section, and this book does a nice job of prompting us with some thoughts about that. First of all, from a spiritual perspective, you look at this and you're like, okay, he's enormously successful, and he's God's man, so therefore God is generous, God is powerful, God is blessing his people, God loves his people, right? And same as today, right? That in some sense, when you see someone whose life seems to be at peace, and they seem to be able to handle things that are happening, and even maybe they're blessed with a little bit of material security, it's part of you thinks it, maybe God's taking care of this person because this person is faithful. Maybe not. This increases God's regard, uh, increases God, regard for God both in Israel and in faraway places, right? That's a good thing, right? Same thing today, right? You you want to believe that when Christians do well, it causes both other Christians to have more confidence, and it also causes people who aren't Christian to look at that and say, all right, God may be for real. I need to take a look at this. Maybe I need to, to learn about Jesus. Maybe I need to be baptized. Inside of Israel, domestic benefits, right? Domestic policy is good, right? All of this fame and knowing that it's known around the world and that it's such a big deal that uh, the Queen of Sheba would come all the way across the world, the known world, to find out more about it, to, to see if it's true. I mean, that's going to make you feel pretty good as a person in Israel, right? Just like it does here. I mean, there's so many things, but for our, you know, this predates me. But if I just think about America in World War II and after World War II and our contribution to the world in World War II and after World War II. As an American, even though I wasn't even alive then, I still, as an American citizen, benefit from that reputation of what America was around the world. And, and you know, and so as a citizen, I'm like, look, I don't think anybody's got a better idea than this country, right? I'm very proud of this country. Um, same thing, you know, if you're in Israel, you're like, well, look at this, we must be a pretty big deal because the guy who's running this place, he's a really big deal all around the world. So that makes his people more loyal. That's good. Domestic benefit. Fame positive, right? Internationally, well, knowing that somebody would come all the way across the world, not to fight a war with this person, not to try to invade, but just to learn from them, that's somebody you don't want to mess with, right? If, if you're one of Solomon's enemies, this fame makes you think twice, right? This fame makes you hold back, makes you think, I don't, I don't think I want to mess with those folks, right? Um, and this encourages even people who are already your allies to stay loyal to you, right? I mean, you're a big deal in this neighborhood. And if you're not an ally, if you're neutral, again, maybe like the Queen of Sheba was or Sabah was, it's like, we probably need to trade with them. They could probably teach us some things. We probably need to ally with them. They could probably teach us some things, right? These are good, positive things. But what about the negative? Well, there's one big thing that kind of jumps out at you. You know, the, the Queen of Sheba talks about how impressive everything is, how wise it is, how it's all true. And then she goes right in with, look how blessed everybody is. And I'm, I'm seeing that your God is really doing something here. Your God obviously put you here. She saw the burnt offerings. She saw the beautiful temple that had been built a few chapters back. And she's like looking at this and she's thinking, your God's a big deal. But even with all those people there, her retinue, a lot of translation says, which is a nice old school word, not as good as gobsmacked, but a good old school word for her entourage, right? All the people who came with her. There's no evidence from this section that the Queen of Sheba pledged loyalty to our God. All that fame, all that money, all that power, all that wisdom, all the rumors, check, 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 check. Every one of them are true, right? I mean, in, a, in modern times, you imagine, you know, going somewhere and being taken around in a limousine and being shown how good everything looks and how wealthy everybody is and how happy everybody is. And, you know, you're in that situation, 
But for whatever reason, and we know it's a different time, but for whatever reason, there's no evidence in the text that she changed what she ultimately believed. Jim Brown likes to quote David Guzik. Sometimes David Guzik is a, is a preacher at a non-denominational church out on the West Coast, um, not by any means endorsing everything that he might say in his commentaries and in his sermons. I would just say that if you're ever having trouble understanding something, he's really good at breaking it down, like we're talking about. And he said, Solomon impressed her with his wealth and his splendor and also impressed her personally. But she returned home without an evident expression of faith in the God of Israel. This shows that impressing seekers with facilities and programs and organization and professionalism isn't enough, right? How many churches today are all about, we're going to have the biggest mega church. We're going to have the most beautiful facility. We're going to try to not just meet the spiritual needs and give people a place to worship God and to learn about God, but we're going to try to have their whole lifestyle contained in there because that's what's going to bring people in, right? And they run these capital campaigns and they build these beautiful facilities and they renovate and renovate and renovate and they expand and expand and expand. But this story says that may not make any difference, right? I mean, you're not going to top Solomon, right? Your gymnasium and your scoreboard and your little league teams and all that, they're not going to be better than what Solomon had. And Jesus says it even better in that passage we referred to, Matthew 12, 42. And I'm, of course, rephrasing him here. That's why those brackets there. He says the queen of the south, but he's talking about the queen of Sheba, came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And indeed, a greater than Solomon is here right? Solomon, material wealth, incredible wisdom as far as we know about manipulating and managing and controlling and affecting the material world of his day, the greatest that ever lived, the wisest that ever lived, extraordinary wealth that's still the subject of incredible lore. And yet Jesus said, there's somebody greater than that, right? Somebody greater than that beautiful facility, somebody greater than the iron chariots, somebody wiser than the man who put all that into place at the high point of the united monarchy of the people of Israel. Let's go a little further. So the question is, what are we famous for, right? That image in the top left-hand corner is from a very, very successful, in terms of numbers, prosperity gospel church, right? Health, wealth, and prosperity. Everybody wants it, right? But that's a lot like coming to see Solomon to learn about his wisdom and see all his money and never go any further about the God that Solomon is supposedly serving. You probably know that bottom picture is from the heyday of the Hillsong movement. Hillsong gave the world a lot of beautiful songs, and a lot of people found Jesus through Hillsong. Started in Australia, now it's the subject of tremendous scandal. They're trying to come back from it. At one point, you know, they had hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people every Sunday morning across the world, as Sunday morning moved across the world, worshiping, physically worshiping in a Hillsong congregational facility. And of course, that's impressive to people too, those big numbers and the fancy stage productions these people must really have something going on. I should probably go to that church. But when it was rocked by scandal, tore it to pieces, right? Because it, most of the people who went there may have been attracted for something that had nothing to do with the God that they were talking about or singing about. Top right-hand corner, and I don't want to disparage church gymnasiums. I think we'd benefit a lot if we had a church gymnasium. But if the only reason that people choose a church is because it has great sports and recreation facilities. You got a question. Are they going to see Jesus or are they going to marvel at Solomon? And in the bottom right-hand corner, of course, this is from a fine European cathedral with an elevated place where important people stand. And there's a lot of beautiful things that happen there and there's a lot of people who are committed to Jesus there. 
But there's probably a lot of people who go there just to marvel at how beautiful everything is, never thinking about that the craftsmen and craftswomen who did all that work thought they were doing it for something greater that they wanted you to look at. Not something Solomon built, but the reason Solomon built it. So here's a few thoughts as we wrap this up. First Peter says, humble yourself and you'll be lifted up, right? So when you are tempted by fame, and maybe none of you are, but we live in the age of internet influencers and social media champions, all of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another because God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. Humble yourselves therefore under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. The Bible teaches us that getting famous is not the way to be better known by God. We're already famous to him, the only audience that matters. We're already well known to him. Jeremiah 1.5 says, Before I formed you in the womb, Israel, I knew you, Judah. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to show the way to the nations. Not to impress the nations with your fancy millwork and your fine engravings. 1 Corinthians 8.3, if you love God, God knows you. That's the fame you need. That's the well-known you need to be known by him. And fame's not required to spread the gospel. As I was preparing for this lesson, I read several accounts of missionaries I had never heard of before. And the list of things they had done in God's, with, in God's providence was absolutely extraordinary. It was the kind of accomplishments that changed nations. And I'd never heard of any of them. 1 Corinthians 1, 27 through 29, God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are, so that no one may boast before him. So we close with a couple of warnings from Matthew's gospel. First, Matthew 5, 16, shine your light so that it points to Jesus, not so that it points to you and your accomplishments, not in a way that that light makes you famous, but makes him famous and well-known and influential. And Matthew 6, 1, the warning to the Pharisees and to us, public practicing of our righteousness if we're doing it to be seen by them, by those others in the public, that's the reward, and we won't be entitled to the real reward that we all so earnestly desire. This is all I have for you today. I'm grateful for the opportunity to talk with you and to wrap this up. Um, we have the new books, and so if I could get some volunteers to distribute the new books, but thank you for your attention, and um, keep Denny and Shirley in your prayers, and I'm sure that uh, they'll be back with us soon. Thank you all.